Okay, okay. we're well, in a... Oh, look, before we begin, I just want to start by uh, sharing a little bit more about Mana Ake. Um, after we took office in the last term, we were acutely aware of the long-term impacts that both the Canterbury and Kaikoura earthquakes were having on children. We had reports from schools of it impacting on their behaviours. We had parents telling us that in some cases of children they were experiencing bedwetting uh, or adverse reaction to even loud noises within a school or within the wider environment. Now, our view was that we needed to do more uh, within schools and amongst those who know those children best, their family uh, and their schooling environment to support their mental health and wellbeing. Mana Ake was a result of that work. Mana Ake is a program that equips teachers with resources but also brings in uh, wider experts from within the mental health, wellbeing and social service community to come into schools and work with children to meet their needs. You know, that could be anything from uh, peer group work, if there are experiences of social isolation and bullying, through to an occupational therapist, if that's what's needed by a particular student. Manaake has helped over 7,000 children in Canterbury and Kaikoura since the programme has been running. And now we're of the view, from based on the feedback that we've had from those schools, parent, uh, schools parents and young people, um, that Manaake is a programme we should make available more widely. We'll be beginning by rolling out Manaake across counties Manako, across lakes, across the Bay of Plenty and the West Coast region. And our intention is to work, uh, and Northland, our intention from there is to expand more widely. Uh, we hope that we'll see the same positive results by providing mental health and wellbeing services within our schools for these young children that we've seen in other regions. Let me give Minister a little a chance to um, add to that as well. Not a lot more to add except to say this is about uh, for um, kids who, you know, they, they've got issues going on, whether at school or at home, um, they can get help to um, work through the feelings, the issues, but also build their resilience. And that's, I think, what's coming of the, um, the Canterbury uh, implementation of it, is that it's, it's really help uh, young people, children, deal with um, the resilience needed to, to deal with some pretty challenging situations. So... Um, We've announced the programme today. What will happen between now and the beginning of the next school year, 2022, is the DHB and um, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education will work with schools and Kura um, uh, to work up a suitable programme for them to implement it in their schools in those particular areas. And then in subsequent years, we'll roll Manaaka out further. OK, happy to take any questions. Uh, Minister Little, on the cost. Cost is $10 million for this phase of the rollout. How do you decide what areas are being rolled out to first? Uh, essentially, how do you decide lakes, Northland, counties in this case? The Minister went through a process with the Ministry of Health identifying where there were particular population based needs, but ultimately, our view is that actually that need exists across the country. And you know we shouldn't be making those judgments just based on age. We hear those stories of our young people, our children in particular, needing that extra little bit of support. And these are skills and part of a toolkit that if they build early on, will support them through all of their adult life as well. How far away is the rollout of this nationally? So we're starting with these five um, DHBs. My hope would be that you know through um, the likes of 2022 that we'll be putting ourselves into a position to continue the rollout from there. This sits along, though, alongside the wider work we're doing for young people, the additional funding you've seen for Youthline, uh, the extension of school uh, nurses in schools for our high school students, uh, and of course we're working on things like counselling-based services in schools. Ultimately what we want to do is create uh, across the country uh, provision of both learning mental health and wellbeing skills, but also providing support uh, right through from primary school aged, uh, right through to our young people who are up around the 24 mark. And then we move into primary health services through GPs clinics. Uh, there should be no wrong door and there should be no wrong age to be able to have these supports in place. But there's no date that you've set. I'll let Minister Little speak more specifically on that. Uh, no, I, but uh, you can expect over the next three to four years we'll continue the rollout um, across the country. Um, this, uh, we've got our big mental health and wellbeing programme that we're rolling out over the next um, four or so years. This will accompany that rollout. And obviously with uh, Canterbury and Kaikoura, there's 
locational like impacts and you know, things that you're looking at for mental health and well-being? Is that something you're seeing in these areas that you have selected now? Like, is there yeah. issues in Northland, issues in the East Coast at the target? Look, so for Canterbury and Kaikoura, the, the, the need there um, was absolutely amplified by the experience that everyone in the region had, but it was particularly um, profound for children. As you can imagine, just the stress and anxiety of those constant aftershocks and the pressure it was putting on their family. And kids, kids are attuned to that. So it was a response to that need. But we have need regardless amongst our children. You know, whether or not they experience grief or family breakdown or the impacts of poverty, we know these things impact on our children. And we know that it, regardless of whether or not it's a wealthy area or not, children will at some point experience challenges uh, with dealing with some of the, the things that life throws at their families and at them. So this is something we want to be universal, but we have targeted based on where we see higher needs amongst our health population. Oh, Minister, is there anything in particular you know, that has sparked this wider rollout for a program that was targeted specifically at Christchurch for a specific issue? Yeah, I, look, I think there is a growing awareness amongst all New Zealanders that if we grow healthy, strong, resilient young people, that we are all better off in the long run. And what we want to do is make sure that rather than picking up on uh, mental health issues as adults or as young people where we reach crisis point, we're equipping our children as early as possible with the skills that will help them in the long run deal with emotions, deal with grief, deal with hardship. Now, our job is to try and take all of those things as much as we can as adults away from them. But there's no doubt kids experience those things. And so there's more we can do to help them as they face those challenges. No, no. Look, it's fair to say that when we developed Mana Ake, uh, which actually was from opposition, uh, it was um, in part because we wanted to see mental health services available uh, at all ages. Uh, it is quite resource intensive to provide, for instance, a very particular form, so say just counsellors in schools, whereas actually what we identified was there actually are teams of people targeting different issues, whether it was billing, isolation, separation issues, or as I say, environmental triggers, teams of people could actually provide real support and that enabled us to roll it out faster. So it's been a long held desire to do this. We're now in the position to start. On resources, how can the government implement Manaki and Kuda that may not have the adequate human resources? Yeah, and that's and that's why, you know, we have we are drawing from uh, those in the community who can provide the response that's tailored to Kura uh, and to our schools' needs. And one other thing going into Manaake, we had a bit of a view that it would be a very particular workforce. What we've learned is that actually collectively teams of people, including in some cases those who facilitate um, sports, uh, they've used that as a tool to teach young people teamwork, how to deal with isolation, how to make sure people, our children are more inclusive. So we've not been really narrow in how these services are provided. We're doing what works for kids and we're doing what works for their schools. But that helps overcome resource issues as well. Yeah. Um, so how will the program cater to that group of people? Yeah, I mean, look, one of the things I might do is hand over to Minister Tenetti, who has a particular focus on uh, making sure that we are meeting within the schooling environment some of those challenges. Um, but if I were to speak um, you know, more broadly, one of the things we know that we need to do is understand the needs of those communities and make sure that we have a workforce who is able, first and foremost, um, to communicate, uh, uh, to have that cultural competency. And so that, those are some of the workforce challenges within health and particularly within mental health that we know we need to face. In the meantime, making sure we're supporting those providers who are working to specific communities. I know Minister Little has been launching programs specifically for Pacifica communities, uh, and that's an example of where we're trying to make sure we're matching funding to community need. Anything you wanted to add? I just, uh, um, the, 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 the way we are rolling up money, OK, has the flexibility that the Prime Minister talked about, so that... Um, if there, and there are plenty of schools with migrant communities, multiple migrant communities, um, so where there is a particular cultural need, then the way it operates is we can bring in uh, more culturally relevant ways of dealing with um, kids who need that extra extra help. Yeah. One, I'll have Minister Tenedi jump in as well, but one of the things that um, Mana Ake was able to do was actually to, to help respond to the impacts of March 15. Uh, you know, we... 
We're very grateful that that program was in place at that time because it was able to pick up on some of the extra need and trauma that you can imagine existed in our schools after that lockdown and that horrific event. On schools, sorry? Yeah, and, and around that, the flexibility that it offers means that it's a bit of a co-design with the schools themselves and with the learning communities themselves. And it, it's not a doing to program, it's a working with program, which is really important in the school sector and something that the sector has in Canterbury has actually really appreciated. And on the March 15, from there, we were able to, as a ministry, able to work into the community learning hubs, which have been really appreciated by the Muslim community in Christchurch, which actually really complements the Manaaki program as well. Smoke free. Yeah, absolutely. Is the fact that you're now having to take such drastic action on this and admission that you're knowing you're having that smoke free by 2025 target? Yeah, I think what you've seen here with this consultation document we've put out, where we're asking the opinions of the community is look, if we all still support those smoke free goals for 2025, if we all want to reduce the extraordinary numbers of, of deaths that we're seeing, um, then this is what it's going to take. It's always going to need those big moves over time, and a number of them have been taken, uh, but actually there is still uh, a number of steps, big steps, that we're asking now for people's views on. Are you confident now with these massive steps you will have to take? Yeah, well, look, what, what we've been told is, you know, the modelling suggests big steps like this will absolutely get us closer to that goal. The, the challenge... No, no, I mean, oh, every, every time, of course, you're making estimates of the impacts of these changes, but the question now we're putting out to the public is are we willing to take those big steps to reach that goal? Because they are big, but the benefit is huge. We are losing you know, up to, as I understand, 12 people a day through smoking and the effects of secondhand smoke. Uh, so uh, are we all in this together, is my question. If you do get quite a lot of backlash from the likes of retailers or, uh, or cigarettes uh, manufacturers on this, would you still go ahead with that? Oh, look, we are absolutely expecting cigarette manufacturers to take a very particular position. For retailers, you know, we do want to hear their view. One of the things we're mindful of is, uh, look, uh, increasingly there have been safety issues of those um, commercial-based robberies. You know, 46% of them are involving cigarettes. Uh, and so now we're saying to them, look, is, is now the time for us to do things differently? Tell us your view. It is a genuine consultation, though. Prime Minister, have you asked Brooke Barrington why he was approving weapons exports to countries blacklisted by the United Nations, and if so, what did he say? Oh, look, I haven't uh, got into individual conversations with our uh, chief executives of both past and present of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. What I'm clear on, though, is that they are the ones that, under our regulations, do hold the responsibility for decisions around uh, uh, compliance with those regs. What we do want to do, though, is actually look at that system. Regardless of who it's been, and we've had obviously two chief executives in recent times, regardless of who it's been, are we confident that the system has been working well? We've got someone independently now looking at that. Well, we have a conversation with Mr Barrington. I think, I think what's probably more important, rather than informal conversation, is actually something that's more public. That, you know, the questions have been raised generally about the way the system is working. We've brought um, someone independently in now, in David Small, to look at the system and to report publicly so people can see his views on what's been taking place here. And that's much more independent and transparent than me having simple conversations behind closed doors. And if he has undermined New Zealand's values, how will he become... Oh, I'm not going to make any assumptions or assertions of that nature. I'd rather actually have someone independently look at what's been happening and give a view not just to me, but the entire public. Brenton Tarrant has launched judicial review proceedings mm. in the High Court, and while today's um, hearing has been postponed, are you concerned that he could use this as an opportunity for grandstanding, and are you concerned about victims being re-traumatised? Oh, oh, look, I, I, I generally um, have uh, held concerns about that, just simply because you see from uh, just the, the nature of this attack from the beginning was about amplifying his his views, uh, and so always very keen to give as little attention uh, or uh, as little acknowledgement of any attempts to do that. Apologies to jump topics here again, but on border testing. Yeah. Does the government accept any blame for border workers who oh, are being routinely tested? Look, look there's, there's no doubt we all have a part to play here. So yes, we have an expectation that employees are tested, we have an expectation that their employers are checking that that's happening, and then yes, we as the government, we're that that final check and balance. And we absolutely recognise there are things we needed to improve to be that backstop measure, uh, and we're doing that. But we also ask everyone to play their part.
So do you accept their responsibility? Yes. Oh, look, we are, we, are that, we are that check and balance, and we do know we need to improve that system, so we absolutely acknowledge that. Uh, we've put an order now in place that's going to help us do that, but we still ask everyone to do their bit too, as we have throughout COVID. Are you 100% confident in calling case for your life? Oh, look, my, my language yesterday was, uh, was, was blunt. I absolutely accept that. But I also, as you've heard me say, I absolutely also accept that we have a role as a check and balance, as we are with any law that we create, to make sure that it's been complied with. But again, I do hope that everyone keeps playing their part. Do you agree calling them out? Oh, I've, you know, I've, as I've said, I think I was probably a bit blunt. Um, but, it does, but it doesn't change my view of the roles we all have to play. And I accept the government's role. We do need to check that we're doing our bit uh, in ensuring people are being tested. We are a final backstop, though. Uh, there is a role for an employee, a role for an employer, and then there's us. The health minister says any overhaul of drug laws would have to go through a referendum. Is that your position? Sorry, start from the beginning. Uh, overhaul of drugs. Who? who, have... who? The minister. Oh yeah. I was just <laughs> wanting to check that was who you were quoting there. Um, but is that your position on having oh, a referendum? Oh, look, what we, what we have said is we've just come out of a referendum where the public have shared their view. Um, but where the minister and I have had discussions is even before the referendum, we'd made alterations to the Misuse of Drugs Act to ensure that for possession it was being treated as a as a health issue rather than a justice issue. And we absolutely believe that you know, it is our job to make sure that that's being implemented as we intended, and that's an era of work we want to keep underway. But would any major change to the Misuse of Drugs Act have to go to a public oh, vote? And again, that, that's all rather subjective, I guess. You know, as I've already said, we've already made some what I would consider quite significant changes. We want to make sure it's working. If it's not working as we intended, we may you know, look at um, those uh, uh, amendments that we've made and whether or not they need to be adjusted. But I think that's still in keeping with the spirit of what people have asked of us. Uh, they've essentially told us what they want on legalisation and, and we, need to, we need to stay true to that. So you could make changes without a referendum? Oh, so again, back on things that we made even before this referendum. So you know, that's an important point to make. What you're asking is, are we going to do anything on legalisation? No, the people have spoken on that. OK, oh, thank you. Oh, last one, and then I'm going to wrap. Um, so we understand that nearly half of um, non-frontline staff of the three Auckland DHBs have been vaccinated, um, whereas there are still 500 um, frontline border, uh, MIQ and frontline um, border worker staff who have not been vaccinated. Overall, so about 11%. Yeah. Do you think this is appropriate? So the majority of our managed isolation facility workers have been, and I think it is important to highlight that. They've put real effort in there and they continue to do a very hard job. So the majority have, and we are very grateful for that. There is a group there, you know, roughly around the 11 per cent mark, who between now and May, if they are not vaccinated, we will need to move them into other roles. And I think it is different for them than others. You know, many others won't be experiencing the fact that their whole jobs will be affected if they're not vaccinated. But just in terms of priorities, like the three DHBs in Auckland have had like 50 per cent, 50, nearly 50 per cent non-frontline staff have already been vaccinated. Yeah. Like, yeah, but what I would Yeah, what I would say is actually it, I, I I don't underestimate the challenge of making sure that specific individuals, thousands of them, specific individuals we are having to make sure are vaccinated. So it's not a matter of just saying if you're a frontline worker, show up and we'll vaccinate you. We are having to target uh, 4,000 specific individuals are making sure that they're fulfilling uh, uh, their health and safety requirements by being vaccinated. If they're not, the ramifications for them are more significant than others. So we have given a bit more time in order to make sure people have the chance to be, but from May, they will need to move. Okay, well, I, did, I did call time, so sorry.